man's world. A man's world. A man's world suddenly run by wives, not running for their lives, but running the world. The wives. Uh, hi, my name is Lavina Jablani. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm thrilled to be directing Wives here at the Aurora Theater. First time I came to the Bay Area was in 2017. I uh, got to assist on row over at Berkeley Rep, right next door, and then um, I've uh, gotten to do a couple shows for the uh, MFA Conservatory Program. A little bit, I got to take my dog off leash to a park. I don't remember the name of the park, um, but there was a little cafe there, which was lovely. And uh, she got to try her first, to my knowledge, she is a rescue, uh, uh, so she has a previous life, but to my knowledge, uh, she had her first in and out uh, last weekend, which was delightful for her and uh, a strange experience for me as a Hindu, to be totally honest, but like, she's happy, I'm happy. <laughs> I had a grilled cheese, it was great. I recommend it. They, they leave everything but the burger. It's great. Uh, I love this play so much that I feel like when I talk about it, it is uh, like the other great love in my life, my dog. I get, I get like a little bit of cute rage. Like, you know, you're like, oh my God, it's so good. It makes me angry a little bit. Because um, this play is like all the things. I mean, I would say at its core, it's a, a fantastic, fierce, funny feminist fight song. Lots of other words that don't involve F, but you know, those are the ones that, that, that rolled off the tongue. Um, it really does, it contains multitudes as we all do. Um, I suppose at its simplest, it, it takes us through four different times and places non-linearly. We, we start in France, we end in a, a fictional uh, present, semi-future, and we sort of zigzag through time. It's such a great acting challenge. We've got four incredible actors who play four different characters throughout this uh, piece, although one of the things that I've come to learn about, it's, it's sort of a, it's sort of structured like a constellation. Like it, it doesn't want to be, obviously we, we experience these four acts linearly, one, two, three, and four, but the, the way the play functions the themes and the ideas from one continue to resonate throughout the following three acts. And so that's why it feels like, it feels like this little bit of a constellation of a play. Like all these pieces are, pieces of the puzzle are, are in tension with and in conversation with each other. Um, I also really enjoy that it, 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 it kind of defies form. I mean, Jacqueline talks about this at one point in the piece. So like no spoilers, but I think, uh, this play contains so much in less than 90 minutes. It also has elements that feel all of a sudden like a musical theater moment. There are moments that are very heightened language and leaning into the voice of Ernest Hemingway. And then there are parts that feel like conversations I pass on the street. Um, and so that Jacqueline can contain all of that into one, one delightful piece is, is, is just an exciting journey for me. And, and the room is so game. Oh, Henri! Yeah. No! Oh. Ladies! Husband! Lover! Who's excited for the tournament? You are. We are so excited for you, my love. A thousand onlookers! The weather will be bright! We'll drink Poussard from the Ventures of Blois. Mwah, mwah, mwah. Mwah. And my trusty steed, Pontius Scott, will see me to an assured victory. Yeah, it's funny how certain writers, you know, follow you throughout your career. I, I, I historically am somebody that uh, my friend Joe Hodge has said, and I, I often repeat, I have a great history of collaborating with dead playwrights, <laughs> you know, as, as somebody who does a lot of Shakespeare and, and who also adapts a lot of things that are in the public domain. That being said, I, I, Jacqueline is one of my favorite living playwrights, all, all, all my favorite living playwrights happen to be Asian American. I also love Lauren Yee. I also love Kui Win. Uh, Mothery Shaker is goals. But but Jacqueline, so this is the third play I've worked on hers uh, uh, in the last 18 months. And something that I really appreciate about Jacqueline's work, so I identify as, as, as first generation or uh, the child of immigrants. Jacqueline, and I got to know this in, in working on a piece of hers called Thank You Letter uh, for Theater 
a theater for one and court theater in Chicago, Tony Award winning court theater, uh, co-produced it uh, last year. And I got to work on this piece that Jacqueline wrote called Thank You Letter that is a, is a, a thank you letter to Congressman John Lewis, but is also gives voice to what uh, the civil rights movement and the legislation of 1965 did in terms of you know, the wave of immigration for her parents to be able to come over. But that for Jacqueline, you know, there's this pioneering energy in works of hers like Men on Boats that I love so much and I've come to understand and, and look to her as somebody who's in that, in that second generation, as somebody who is in the grandchild of immigrants. And it's so exciting for me to see, I think one of the reasons her work can contain multitudes. And I see this so much in writers like Kui, a lot of these writers that are first gen that are just like collaging everything together because like we sat in the intersection of all these different cultures. And so like, yeah, all of it is fair game. And I think Jacqueline, the combination of, of being second generation, I think having both German and Punjabi heritage, but also just, you know, being being a cool woman with some awesome craft and 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 right like that's the other thing that is that is incredible to me about her and Lauren Yee very different writers but everything that comes out of their brains every single piece I will I will I will come up and I will I will I will see everything I'm not necessarily the right person to direct uh, every single play that they write I do think I'm the right person to direct this play but everything that these women write is ambitious smart, funny, but entirely different in form. Like this play is entirely different than Men on Boats, than Thank You Letter. So yes, it's, it's, it's my third Jacqueline Bacchus play, but it's also like, it's also my first time. But the thing is, so I used to run a South Asian theater company in Chicago for six or seven years, depending on how you wanna, how you wanna slice it, years, seasons. And I have to be honest, this is, this is the type of play that I always wanted to do there. Um, and I, in some ways, had challenges getting it past the patriarchy of the leadership, which is so interesting because this is one of the things that, that this play really does want to do across all four acts, across uh, all the forms that it takes, is that it really does want to challenge the patriarchy, which people of all genders can, can support or challenge in their actions. And I think one of the really cool ways that Jacqueline does this is is through the casting imperative. So the the conceit that, that, that Jacqueline has assigned to this play just by writing it the way that she has is that we have these four actors across all four acts. And sometimes those, uh, for the most part, those actors are playing historical figures. Um, sometimes they are playing figures uh, who, sometimes those are South Asian actors playing South Asian historical figures. Sometimes those are South Asian actors playing Ernest Hemingway and his wives who were historically white. Um, something else that the play does that I really enjoy in terms of its casting imperative is, um, you know, at the beginning of the piece in part one, we have a, a male actor playing male roles and female actors playing female roles. And as the course progresses, that too, I think, evolves and changes. And so what the piece I think is asking in terms of, you know, gender and sexual identity and what it's opening up for that to be, you know, for that to be fluid, for that to be a spectrum is a really exciting conversation. But I also will say like, in terms of the racial identities of the space, it's, it's, it's so exciting for me as somebody who's a Francophile to drop into this play starting in France and starting with three of the four characters in this world. Also being South Asian as that girl who took French lessons from, you know, from age, age four, uh, uh, not age four, grade four. Um, but like my French is better than my Hindi. And so like, I feel very seen by this first act of it. You know, uh, and I remember one of our actors uh, spoke about getting to see the world premiere of this production in New York and for her, being a young South Asian woman, it was, it was, uh, I don't want to speak for her experience, but what I, what I heard from her was that it was, it was almost overwhelming to see this story through a lens that for her was so familiar. And, and I'll say that for me, you know, as somebody who identifies as Indian American, as, as first gen, I'm working on this play in this moment. I love working on this play in this moment because um, TV and I love plays. TV and film is so good right now. TV and film is so good right now and TV and film is having an incredible moment when when we look at the centering, the recentering of epic stories through the South Asian lens. And that could be season two of Bridgerton. It could be Miss Marvel. I, I, I'm watching it all. I'm watching it all and I'm watching it all because I've been watching it 
you know, since I was young for the culture, right? Mindy was there. I watched it. Priyanka was on Quantico. I watched it. But now there's so much more of it and it's so cool and it's so overwhelming. And so for me as a theater artist, seeing, seeing plays like this that are like, frankly, starting to catch up are really, really exciting. And for me, it's, it's the type of piece that I feel really at home working at because I know that in the text is this collage of references. And so I feel comfortable as a director bringing as much of, of myself and the multitudes and all of the collage of references that I enjoy and contain into the room, which then I think just brings it, brings the conversation amongst the cast and the acting company to be, be more specific. And that's how I think we get to that good old adage of through specificity comes universality. This, this creative team is, is great. I know some of, them are, some of them are familiar to Aurora, some of them are familiar to me. Everybody's working together for the first time. Hey. <laughs> Hey, sorry, let me just, no, of course. madam, this creative team, this creative team is, is so great. Uh, some of them are, are, are I believe, uh, familiar to Aurora. Some of them are familiar to me. I think everybody is working together for the first time. And it is, it's, uh, it's a gift and it's a challenge because you get four plays for the price of one. <laughs> So again, through this like constellation structure, you know, Jacqueline has has created these four really specific worlds that the same actors want to uh, create. And so they're entirely different. And yet, if you look at the way she's crafted the language, there is some really beautiful connective tissue uh, linguistically between them. And so something that the design team, we said early on, okay, we want to be specific about these four worlds. But one of the things that I think is great about the way that the play progresses is like once we find the vocabulary of act one all of those ideas I think are still available in act two in act three and act four you know it's something I also really appreciate about Jacqueline's writing is it's theatrical and I know I was just talking about how great TV and film is and it is but like if I'm going to leave my house to see a piece of theater I want to see a piece of theater and and I think that um Jacqueline has written things like a witch with a cauldron that bubbles into parts of this play. Again, I want to avoid spoilers, but uh, we have a fantastic team, including an amazing prop designer who's just like, yeah, I'll make that cauldron bubble. And so it's a really fun piece to work on because it contains multitudes. It has this great scope, and yet it really does want to be a playful piece of theater. So we as a design team, I think, don't have to be boxed into solely realistic solutions. It is a play, again, avoiding spoilers, but that, that has a little bit of magic in it, let's say that. It's fun, you know, I, uh, <laughs> I for whatever reason, the, I, I have a wealth of, of Bollywood at my knowledge that just tends to come into, a specifically like the aughts stuff, the like early to mid aughts is like, Boom, my wheelhouse. So yeah, for whatever reason, I was like, boom three, which is not, I think that's actually early teens, um, I think has the energy of this piece in, in part because I think like great Indian action movies, RRR is doing so well right now and I'm beside myself um, because I think it, one, it just dropped on Netflix. It is a Hindi dub, but like it's a great film, but also like it is part three of this play if like, Tarantino wrote it instead of Jacqueline Bacchus wrote it. Like it's it's just it's wild. Um, but so yeah, I think I think what is one of the th first of all, it, it it just it makes sense to me. I like having uh, a team, a, a design team, and a cast that has multiple points of entry. I mean, that was something we talked about in the ca even in the casting process. Like South Asian is not a monolith, um, and so we have a range of of um, representation there, even amongst the cast. And um, you know, I, I love that on day one I was. Uh, it depends on the nature of the piece that I am I am working on. But you know, on day one of this piece, I was able to walk in and say, Hey, not only am I Indian American, I'm Sindhi, and I knew that this room would understand that in a way that you know, not every every. Uh, room has the context to know that like, oh, the state of Sindh is in, you know, what is now Pakistan and that's where my, where my people were post-partition, but now we're kind of everywhere because post-partition, um, uh, at least the, 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 the Hindus of us. And um, so 
it only made sense. I don't know. We, we, we hired all the best people for these jobs, really. But one of the things that is amazing about having a design team with so many points of entry on a play that already has a lot of points of entry is that, you know, for me, I'm always thinking about when creating the work. And oftentimes the design process starts way ahead of the of the actual rehearsal process in the room, you know, thinking about how many points of entry can there be? For me, part of what makes theater accessible is not just, you know, what the cost of the ticket is, how you physically enter the theater, but it's also about like, oh, as I'm watching this work, how can it both be specific to the cultures that it represents, but also like, how can there still be something for me? And I think uh, through the lens of what I call identity conscious work, but bringing, you know, what I'm specific about my identity and how it vibrates with this piece, uh, to the table, like there are there are parts of this play that that talk about uh, witchcraft, and you know what? I am somebody who's gotten a little woo in the pandemic, and so like I'm going to bring my cards into rehearsal today. I've never done that before. You know, I'm certainly not somebody who is is qualified to do readings for other people or anything like that. But I do I do have a practice for myself, and that's in the nature of the play. And so like I love that that I feel comfortable enough in this room to bring those things in, and and you know I think we lead by example. But then it's been great to see how everybody else in this room yes ands that and says okay well here's a part of the story that i identify with that like i'd like to help craft specifically it's a i will never tire of saying it it's a gift to be back in person doing what we're, we're doing again i stayed home and i watched a lot of great tv but there's a reason we do what we do in terms of live theater my my friend mentor nemesis joe hodge talks about he runs the guthrie he talks about like there is this this thing that happens that like our heartbeats sync up when we're about to you know share this kind of communal experience so it's been it's been great just to be back and to, and to have that as both an art as both an artist and an audience member that's been really satisfying um but I will also say, like, for me as an artist in this moment, the way that it's changed my approach to the work is it's just, it's just, it's really people first. It's really people first. I think one of the things that was great about the pandemic was that, and when we did all of the digital plays, was that, you know, as somebody who does have a background in arts management, I was watching the people versus stuff debate. And, you know, we spent more money making those digital plays for the most part on the people because the stuff was, it wasn't as important. And so that's something as we're, as we're coming back and like, I do like seeing plays with stuff too, you know, right? Like I, after talking about that amazing design team, I do like seeing all the beautiful costumes and all of the things. And um, so it's very, it's a very satisfying experience. But for me as a leader, I'm finding that for myself in the moment, it's, it's just, it's consistently about like people first. I've been working really hard on uh, removing as much as I can as a Virgo, the sense of perfectionism and urgency in my practice. And really just knowing that um, I spent a lot of, of the, the peak of the pandemic online reading Shakespeare plays with a bunch of friends. And one of the things that we would always say is, um, or that we came to say together as a group is, we're all gonna cross the finish line together. and. Uh, so that's what the process has been about for me coming back along across the finish line together. So I currently identify as a director and I like working on heightened language plays, which can be to me anything. It can be Shakespeare, it can be this. I think this is a beautiful heightened language play. Jacqueline writes incredible poetry, but also like act two has some gorgeous prose in it. Um, but I, and, and so, and, and through, through that and through, I think, my passion for words, I've started to find my way into adapting things like A Christmas Carol, worked on a lot of Chekhov um, in the pandemic, but also have been, um, you know, wrestling with, with South Asian classics like the Ramayana, which is hella patriarchal. So I wrote the version that I wanted to see, which was called the Sitayana, um, uh, wrestling with Shakuntala, which is this um, old Sanskrit play. And I'm like, why aren't these also part of the canon? Um, I think something that's been true for a lot of my career is like, and something I've, I've grown to really like about myself is like, when I get mad about something, or especially like the absence of something, like, why aren't we doing that? Why aren't there, why isn't there more of this? Why are there more people like me on Bridgerton? I didn't make that happen. But, you, you, you know, but like, I think, I think doing more plays like this is how we, is how we start to move the needle and how we start to change, you know, the conversations that are in the zeitgeist. Um, so I think that's been a lot for me growing up in between, you know, Indian and American. I grew up in a, in a predominantly white suburb, and so I didn't have a lot of reflections of self for those, those first, I would say, 14 years of my life. And then I transferred to a math and science magnet high school uh, where, uh, you know, because at the time I was, I was a product of STEM learning, and especially at the time in the, in the 90s, if you were, if you were a, a smart girl in the gifted program, you got sort of pushed towards STEM learning. So like, that's what I did, because again, culturally that was the norm, but it was very funny because I, 
I maintain to this day, if I had not, I, I went to that math and science high school and came out an artist because, uh, because everybody there was smart. And I was like, oh, OK. What kind of smart am I? Oh, I think I'm this kind of smart. And I really appreciated that that school also put great imp import on not just having good ideas, but being able to communicate and share them and, and, and you know, and be able to, I, I really do think I got, I got good collaborative muscles, but I, I knew I wasn't an actor. I, um, I did like singing. I liked being, I always liked being part of the, you know, I'll, I'll be a part of the school musical. Um, but so that's how I found my way into, into scenic design first which became directing, which also evolved into, into now some writing. And now at this point when people are like, oh yeah, of course you write. Uh, and are very complimentary of my work, which I love, but I also somewhat, somewhat jokingly and somewhat self-deprecatingly say, you know, oh yeah, I, just, I ran out of all the other jobs to do in the theater. But I do think that's one of the things that, that I love about my background as a director is I've, I've done, I've sewn the labels in the costume. I've been that artistic director who has run the box office and I've directed Shakespeare on the Guthrie. And so, you know, I, I, for me, it's about, bringing deep respect to the work that everybody does because like I've done that job at some point I've held that paint paintbrush I've, I've tried to you know sc screw that whatever uh those walls together and uh not very well apparently <laughs> but um you know so for me it's about n not not wanting to micromanage but like understanding again as we as we put the people first understanding like what other people's work is uh understanding what they need and making sure they get that um I think has always been important to me, and so I think. But I do think that's that's why I like directing. Uh, Fifty thousand pounds of my gold cube shall be melted down into a smallish, medium-sized bust of me, as I am remembered in the midst of my mid twenties. What a fuckhead! Fourteen stacks of gold shall go to Digby St. Claude, my masseuse and guide for his services at home and abroad. Fine, fine, fine. Oh. Oh. <clears throat> the chateau, adjacent houses, gardens, vineyard, mill, staff, regiments, and nearby farming town of Chateauneau will go to Okay. 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 Okay, I'm just going to. So on the 19th of June, which celebrates the uh, emancipation of the slaves in Texas, the last slaves in the Confederacy who were still being held almost two full years after they were freed and, uh, and well after the Civil War, uh, the uh, uh, slaves were freed in Texas uh, when uh, used to know the these uh, soldiers' name, uh, Lieutenant, landed in Galveston, Texas, and then uh, said, uh, "You're free," and freed those slaves. That's a celebration that happens around uh, the country in a lot of different places on Juneteenth. Um, yes, the Thirteenth Amendment is also important because it freed the slaves that were uh, in Union states. But the uh, last Confederate fl slaves were freed with Juneteenth. And we think that freedom, that uh, emancipation, and uh, those tones of equality are important when it comes to the Black Lives Matter movement. 